one thing that has become clear to me over the last couple of years is the extent to which we don't seem to have finished thinking about the relationships between performance, theatre and martial arts training. These relations are being um, posed and broached in a very wide variety of ways. We've had keynotes and panellists talking about uh, tackling the questions at all of our conferences so far. And we regularly see articles proposed and submitted to the journal, to martial arts studies. There are also numerous books coming out on the connections between performance and combat. In our first conference, um, two years ago, we saw presentations on, among other things, efficacy and entertainment in martial arts. Um, last year, we encountered a lot of work on the relations between theatre, performance studies and martial arts. And at this point, we're now about to engage with the relationships between dancing and fighting. Um, as a, as a kind of aside, um, I've often heard people claim that there are connections between being a good dancer and being a good fighter or a good martial artist. Um, these are anecdotes, and I kind of hope there is no truth to them, um, or at least not a direct relationship, <laughs> because I don't want anyone who has seen how terrible a dancer I am to leap into any kind of obvious conclusions. <laughs> um, nonetheless, um, as we've all seen from our abstract, Professor Gitanjali Kolonad has proposed at least one kind of relationship in at least one kind of context. Um, and this is what we'll turn to soon. Professor Kolonad was involved in the practice, performance, and teaching of uh, Bharata Natyam uh, for close to 40 years. She's performed in major cities in Europe, America, and India. Her short story collection, Sleeping with Movie Stars, was published in January 2011 by Penguin India. And she's written numerous articles on aspects of Indian dance for well-known Indian publications. She's recently been the 2016 Singapore Na International Writer in Residence with NUS University Scholars Program and the Arts House. And she co-founded Impact, which teaches and promotes Indian martial art forms. Presently, she's a professor at Shiv Nadar University, developing their performing arts program. So it's with great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, that I introduce Professor Gitanjali Kolonad. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I, I really have been enjoying all the papers so far. And they've given me quite a lot of confidence to say what I'm going to say. Uh, that Peter pointed out that there's, well, I'm, I'm cherry picking a little bit, but Peter pointed out that there is no objective realm to combat. And uh, Sixth Wexler said that aestheticizing and formalizing are quite legitimate strategies for coping with the idea of violence. And Benjamin Judkins said one should seize upon minutia. And that's really what I'm going to do. And um, that we should try to maintain an appropriate balance between theory and practice. And he also suggested that um, martial arts studies is a martial art. And uh, I haven't reached the stage in that of PowerPoint. So I don't have any PowerPoint <coughs> to, um, so you'll just have to listen to me. So uh, the relationship between dancing and fighting uh, functions on many levels and people talk about it all the time like the relationship between ballet and fencing or um, it, is capoeira a dance form or a martial art form and peking opera and kung fu and uh, in indian dance styles there are many relationships there's chow which is based on a martial arts tradition that no longer exists but all the dancers stand do the whole dance holding as if they're holding a, a sword and shield. And um, many of the forms are based on stick and sword techniques. And uh, Thang Tha from Manipur, which is another martial art form, which um, is part of the ritual tradition. So the boys tend to do Thang Tha and the women tend to do, girls and women tend to do the uh, dance forms that go with those rituals and Kathakali where the 
young Kathakali uh, artists, male, go through a training very similar to the Kalari Payat training, and they go through the massage. It's the same for both the martial arts practitioners and the um, Kalari Payat pa practitioners. And Tayam, which is a ritual form that uses um, ka ka uh, Kalari Payat-like movements. So, you know, I could have chosen to sp uh, speak of any of these relationships, but my project is a little bit different. I'm, I, I'm looking to find a relationship that's more like uh, if you were to try to find the relationship between dolphins and human beings, not looking at very superficial aspects of the form or the history or anything like that. And um, I, I'm working from my experience as a practitioner in Bharatanatyam and in Kalari Payat. And so this relationship might seem uh, a bit far-fetched. Um, so there is a story about a dancer, uh, Yamani Krishnamurti. Now, Yamani Krishnamurti is in my field of dance, she's like Boris Beck, uh, Becker in tennis or uh, Beckham in f um, football. She's so very well known. And uh, she's uh, an iconic figure in Bharatanatyam. So the story is that one day when she was performing, one evening when she was performing of uh, one of the pieces for which she's most well known, um, a, a song in which she calls out to Krishna. Krishna is the, the god who's the object of the song. She calls him and she says, come here. And in that calling, somebody in the audience, it seems, somebody who was sitting in the front row, got up and started to come on stage. And this may be an apocryphal story. I, I can't say that I saw this, but the story has been told to me uh, more than once. Many different people have said, oh yeah, and Yamini Krishnamurti, she's so uh, good at this dance form. She was saying, come to Krishna, and somebody got up. And there are all kinds of explanations for how this happened. Um, the guy was Middle Eastern. Uh, so this idea of coming up onto the stage is part of the tradition. Or he was drunk and he didn't really know what was going on. But it, to me, this, the point of the story is not whether it actually happened or not. And in fact, if it's an in invented story, there is almost more of a reason to take it seriously than if it's, um, it actually happened. And there are other stories of a similar kind, not just about Bharatanatyam. So in Kudiyatam, which is another style, uh, their Kudiyatam artist is uh, so good that when he threw a stone, a dog uh, whined as if it had been hit. So this idea that uh, even animals are affected. And Kavala Narayana Panikkar, one of uh, the <coughs> great theater directors of Kerala, he's done a whole play. And the premise of the play is this um, ability of the theatrical artist. Um, it, it's uh, in which the Kudiyatam artist uh, he's about to commit suicide and he goes into the forest and then he meets a rogue elephant and uh, he's just, you know, he's going to do one more thing. And what he does is he uses his Kudiyatam uh, art form to create elephant, to, to do an elephant. And the Kudiyatam elephant defeats the real elephant. That's the whole premise of the play. And so what is going on in this, in this um, um, 
cons this consideration of these overlapping worlds. It's very often spoken of as the dancer is creating something that's so real that um, the, the boundary is blurred. And, and, and that's a little bit like Plato, Plato's consideration. That's why he thought artists shouldn't be in the, in the ideal republic. Uh, it's like those hyper-realistic paintings. It's when, uh, it's when the artist seems to be tricking people through this hyper-reality. And um, he thought that um, that was a bad thing when you imitate reality so well that somebody in the audience might mistake it for reality and um, react to the representation and then let that representation affect your response to the real world. He, he thought that was the problem with artists and uh, therefore we should be very careful about having them in our republic. Um, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's what's going on at all. And especially if you see, for example, Kudiatam, there is no way that you could um, mistake it for reality. It, it's not a, it's not, it's a highly stylized art form. And um, uh, when they do, for example, the woman, they kind of delineate a woman from her head all the way down to her feet. And they say her hair is like the peacock's tail and her eyebrows are uh, like uh, the, the, um, the bow of the god of love and her eyes are like lotus petals and then they, they go on and they go on throughout the whole body and then they build up and, and they go through every part of her body. Her breasts are so close together and they're so full that you can't even get, put your hand in between them and her navel is uh, so deep and she has three creases and then her pubic mound is like a cobra. And then the cobra starts to come up in the, in the artist's hands. And then the cobra comes up through these, across these mountains of these three ridges. And then it comes up and it tries to get through her breasts, like in between her breasts and it can't. And then when it looks up, it sees her face, which is like a full moon, and it's really attracted to the sh uh, shining gems of her eyes. And then, and then all of a sudden it's frightened by the peacock, the hair that's spread, uh, spread down, and it rushes back down, and it becomes her pubic mount. Now this, is, this in no way can be mistaken for a woman. It's a concatenation of metaphors that all come together in this incredibly um, uh, delightful moment when everything kind of falls into place. And uh, in India, the idea that this, this line of, small line of hair that goes from the navel to the pubic mound is considered to be very beautiful and that's how it occurred through this snake that tried to come up and then went back down again. There is no way that you could mistake the woman of the uh, Kudiyatam uh, imagery for a real woman. And it's the same with the elephant. When they display the elephant, it's the same way. So what's going on? And uh, in Bharatanatyam, it's different. So it's not like um, the 
Bharatanatyam way of working with metaphors is uh, just this way. It has a whole different way, and the way Bharatanatyam works is um, it suggests scenarios and it suggests moments in a in a, um, uh, an unfolding event and it's between a man and a woman it's it's generally to be between a man and a woman and um, each description of a possible moment doesn't preclude any other moment. So for example, in one of my favorite padams, Netrandi uh, Neratile, it says down at the uh, banks of the river at twilight, I saw you making eyes at another woman. Who is she, my lord? And so when she, the dancer suggests twilight, she says, it's the time when lamps are lit. It's the time when the cows are taken to the stable. It's the time when the birds uh, come into pairs to roost. And um, it's the time when, you, when she goes down to the river to take her pot of water. But none of these you, you can't be lighting the lamp and going down to the river at the same time. It's not that each one precludes the other, it's that they all converge to create this one moment. And the moment in um, Indian terms is called uh, rasa. When uh, rasa is created, that interaction between the audience and the dancer happens and this is both Kuriyatam and Bharatanatyam even though they function on two totally different uh, stylized systems they both refer to the same text the same text is the Natya Shastra um, and the Natya Shastra is a text on dramaturgy so According to the Natya Shastra, uh, you create this rasa, this interaction with the audience in a particular way. And um, uh, the procedure is um, through a combination of what are called vibhavas, anubhavas, and vyabhachari bhavas, determinants, consequence and transitory states. But Bharata is quite clear that rasa is a theatrical experience and not to be mistaken for the real experience of emotion. And he's also very clear that it arises through the interaction of an observer who is learned in the conventions of the form and a performer trained in the specific techniques to be depicted. And, and this, to me this is the important thing because um, uh, Western uh, cons uh, notions and considerations of art very often don't consider the audience. It's a, a form of self-expression. It's for myself. I'm doing it because I really want to do this. This is how I feel about something. And um, therefore, any kind of expression that answers those needs might be considered um, uh, acceptable in a, in a Western dance form. But it's not likely to be the case in the Indian classical forms, that even very unrelated forms look back to the Natya Shastra for um, um, the system that will uh, give rise to rasa. And um, so the dancer clearly at one level she's being seen on the stage by an audience. 
she's in her costume, you're seeing the costume, you're seeing lights, you're seeing the, uh, the makeup, the, the music, whatever the setting is. But at the same time, she's uh, projecting, enacting, performing, embodying another seeing. She is seeing her lover. He isn't there, uh, but the dancer sees him nevertheless. And the a song is likely addressed to him, like uh, the, the Yamini song is addressed to Krishna. It's addressed to her lover. And um, her gaze goes to him, or rather to his absence. He's not there, but she sees him anyway. And as John Berger pointed out in the Western context, the act of seeing entails the being seen. Uh, there's an Indian word for this reciprocal seeing, and, and I'm going to come to that later. In fact, the dancer's seeing is made most clear by the effectiveness of her portrayal of being seen. Her seeing of him is being seen. And her glances are full of longing, anger, jealousy. They're coy, they're indignant, they're amorous, they're contemptuous in response to him. Thus, the audience sees her through him, seeing her as he would see her. Wherever the dancer may be in the physical space, the lover is the focusing point. Rather than being seen by a sea of eyes, she is seen by a pair of eyes through which the individual eyes of the audience are directed. The eyes of the non-existent, invisible lover nowhere to be found on stage. She looks to us as she would look to him. It is only insofar as the dancer sees the lover that she can surrender to the being seen and that the audience can slip into the role of the lover and uh, see the dancer through his eyes. Uh, and in the, dan the dances in which the dancer invokes the lover's presence are the majority of dances in my, in my form. Bharatanatyam, almost the varnam, the padams, the javalis, even some of the other items like a shabdam and whatever are all expressed in this way. Uh, and each padam or javali creates a circumcised world for the, uh, for the audience to explore. And um, so in each song, he can, he can assume a different role. She's indifferent to him, uh, or he's indifferent to her, more likely. Uh, he's come to her with the marks of some other woman's uh, lovemaking on his body somewhere. Um, he's um, sheepishly gone, come to her house, mistaking it for somebody else's house. And, um, uh, or uh, very rarely, he's, he's the satisfied lover. That also happens once or twice. Um, and, and so this circumscribed world that the dancer creates with these infinite possibilities of what might happen in this interaction where no path is cut off by her choosing one path. It's very similar to the way a raga is explored in Indian music. That's, that's a, 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 a myriad of possibilities is brought up so that the whole uh, mood of the song can be explored. Uh, so the dancer in actualizing the being seen by her lover allows us or perhaps even forces us to encounter the moment with her. 
It is not that the dancer then creates a simulacrum of reality. She's not even attempting that. Rather, it is that her theatrical world is so fully realized that the audience member can enter it. So it's not that she becomes real, but that he becomes theatrical. He takes on the role of, of Krishna, and he feels himself to be more Krishna because of the way that she sees the Krishna that's not there and the audience can step into that. So that's my interpretation of Yamini's in, uh, incredible um, gift. In Elizabeth Leconte's words, Yamini transformed herself, uh, transformed from self to more self, becoming so much Satyabhama that the audience member is free to become Krishna in response. Now, the ephemerality of dance as an art form has made it more resistant to examining these kinds of things. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I don't show a clip of Yamini or something like that, for example, is because um, I don't want you to ever kind of mistake the video for the dance. You know, the, the two things are entirely different. And a video of a dance is not a dance. And lots of times people, uh, when I say I do Kalari Payet, they say, oh, yeah, I've seen Kalari Payet. Oh, where did you see it? On YouTube. That doesn't mean you've seen Kalari Payet. And in the same way, you can't really get a feeling for what uh, Yamini was doing by seeing a clip of Yamini. And um, I don't want you to mistake that. I don't want you to kind of make that uh, error of categories. Now, what does all this have to do with uh, martial arts? In Kalari Payet, uh, we have something called a Mei Payetu, in which the um, practitioner goes through a sequence of moves and when they're first taught, there's absolutely no uh, sense of application. They're taught as a form. The first movement uh, is a raising of the arms and pulling in and going out through that um, could almost be done like a yoga movement with breath and uh, with a kind of bending and flowing movement. And um, um, I think most martial art forms have these kinds of forms that you practice all on your own without uh, the sense of grappling or you're in competition, um, that you just do on its own for to formalize a technique. And in um, uh, Kalari Payet, even the forms that you practice eventually in partnered sequences, you practice on your own first. And you perfect them without any idea of what the application of the movement is. And, but then, after a certain point, you start to uh, learn that this uh, upward movement is supposed to be grabbing somebody from behind and then bending so that you can throw them over your head. And so, uh, but in the very next movement, it's a, a, an, a, a step with the left foot. So there's the opponent. He's in front of you now. You, he, first he was behind you, now he's in front of you. And so it's not in any sense the, uh, the idea of a real opponent. And uh, yesterday when I saw uh, Collins 
uh, demo of kung fu moves, there is no opponent, there was no opponent that could have been in all the places that the attacks went, or at least no single opponent. So, as philosopher Alva Noe said in an interview, the capacity to see and the ca capacity to move are interwoven. As we move, the view changes. We better understand and know the environment we're in by moving through it. But it is not enough to practice our postures, attacks and blocks, seeing before us the empty stage of the kalari, the empty space of the kalari, as one is objectively doing. So the way the, mo uh, the meipaitu starts, it can be done almost like yoga. You can have the intake of breath. You can concentrate on that upward movement and then the flowing in and uh, almost S-like movement of the uh, coming out um, like a wave. And this is definitely one way to approach it and the way that many people do approach uh, the meipaitu. And, and, um, uh, this is definitely the way it's first taught. By leaving its applications as a fighting technique out, the student can concentrate on the outer form. But as the student advances, the position of the opponent becomes paramount to the perfection of the form into a cohesive flowing movement. First, the opponent is imagined behind, then the move becomes a grab and throw. Then with the first step, um, imagining the attacker as, as right-handed, right-footed, the way most opponents will be, you step forward with your left foot. And um, I see these to be like the improvisational sequences of Bharatanatyam, where, like the woman who's lighting the lamp and feeding the cow aren't mutually um, exclusive, both create um, and both contribute to that uh, creation of the um, appropriate movement. And the attacker is wherever he needs to be in order to make the practitioner uh, do the movement properly. And it's only by seeing the attacker that one's own attacks can be aimed or placed or timed or balanced to exert the right force. Thus, we have an analogous situation. By fully imagining the opponent, seeing where the vital points are and where the fists or feet should be, um, one perfects one's own movements. The pattern sequences are in effect a partner dance with one partner visible and one partner invisible. In practice, both as dancer and fighter, the evocation of the other that informs one's own positions and attitudes is not always made explicit. So even as a dancer, my dance teacher did not say that this is how you should perfect your calling Krishna by spending a lot of time on imagining him there in front of you. That's something that I came to as a pr practitioner and uh, only as a, seen, as, an, as a more advanced dancer, like when I started learning with Kalanidhi Narayan, one of the uh, teachers in it, major, major teachers in India. <clears throat> to the extent that theatrical art is imitation, it is the imitation of action. The work of the warrior is heroic action, and the imagined other leads to actions. In Kaleri, the master emphasizes that one must always look up and yet keep awareness of uh, one's peripheral vision take the jumps in such a way that one covers distance, that one surprises the opponent, um, and that one must keep one's own vital organs always protected. These injunctions are, are uh, in response to attacks. To again quote Noe, 
The skillful ability to move is at the very core of what it means to be a conscious perceiving agent. As recent research into what happens when we watch another person moving shows, the perception of another person's body in motion gives rise to reciprocal top-down and bottom-up processes between the actor and the observer. Imagination is tied up with visual perception. In creating an imaginary opponent, we are creating in ourselves a quality of movement. No longer is there the simple pattern in which one moves according to, the, to a pre-made structure, but now the practice takes on a life of its own. The rhythm changes. The body stretches, not to stretch, but to reach. There is force behind the punches, and there is stability in the defense. This is especially important in uh, the martial arts because practice with the actual opponent is always restricted. There is no time when you're, you're actually trying to make these blows land as effectively as exactly where you need them. In Kalari Payet, especially because we always practice with real weapons and with no protection. So there is no time in Kalari Payet where um, you can, you can uh, fully try to attack your oppo opponent's points where you're supposed to be doing it. Um, when the partner is real and not imaginary, so are the injuries that can occur. So rather than freedom, the real opponent leads to a containment of the action, aiming with sticks or swords for the air instead of the ear, the shield instead of the person behind it. Only the op imaginary opponent is fair game. Limitless force can be harnessed and unleashed on this absent warrior. It is the very fact of the opponent's not being there that allows one to surrender so completely to the action, to allow the body its full extension, range of movement, and strength. The choreography of the moves is a distillation of techniques into a formal structure for practice. Blows and blocks, advance and retreat, kicks and turns. Without the inner work of the imagination, this is empty. But in no circumstance can a sequence like the Meipai to be likened to a real fight. And this is equally true of the expression that emerges on the face of the dancer. This is not how she's actually going to fight with her lover. The, it's something that we wouldn't really want to watch. And uh, so I think what the imaginary opponent creates is a field of action. In the dance, the Im imaginary lover creates an inner feeling that does not necessarily express itself in movement, but in both cases, the presence of the opponent or lover within the absence disinhibits and frees the practitioner to move beyond real life limitations, to go from self to more self. The dancer is transformed into the woman of the poem by seeing and being seen by the lover. The Kalari Payet practitioner is transformed by practicing with the imagined opponent. In the same way that the devotee is transformed by seeing and being seen by the deity in the temple. The reciprocity and transformative quality of the seeing and being seen in the dance and Kalari Payet is similar to the seeing and being seen of the religious experience of darshan. So this is the word I was referring to. So it's, it's, it's what John Berger says. As soon as you're seen, it entails, no, as soon as you see something, that entails your being seen. And so uh, you can't look at the Mona Lisa. You can't see something other than paint and pigment and canvas behind it. 
You can't see the Mona Lisa without being seen by the Mona Lisa. So that was Berger's point. And it's very similar to the, con the Hindu concept of darshan, where you go to see the deity so that the deity can see you. And, uh, but this seeing of darshan is, it's a kind of touching in Diana Eck's words, um, that there's, it's a more Im immediate sensory contact is made through the um, Indian word darshan than is conveyed in the English word seeing. Um, so, um, Seeing suggests a kind of passiveness, light waves are coming in, but darshan conveys this kind of um, uh, active, the activity of seeing. By seeing, you're reaching out towards the, the object of your, your wanting darshan from, and the object of darshan is reaching out towards you. And, um, uh, it, it kind of ties in to the uh, uh, many Kalaripayat myths of being able to kill with the glance. You know, you look at the marma points on the opponent with a certain kind of uh, glance and those pierce and you don't even have to go near the opponent to, to um, affect this. Uh, the, you know, it's all tied into that same idea. And uh, into the final state of awareness in Kalaripayat, where you're considered to be su in such a state of awareness that the body becomes all eyes. Now, do I have any precedent for considering the imaginary lover and the imaginary warrior to be so important to the practitioner? Certainly within the literature on perception and cognitive function, which I'm not an expert on at all. But um, uh, it's interesting that, um, as for example, scientists can more easily tell from brain imaging um, whether a person is looking at a face or a map. They can distinguish that. It's more difficult for them to tell whether a person is looking at a real face or an imagined face. The same areas of the brain um, are used to imagine a face as they are to look at a face. So I think I have some, some um, cognitive science basis for thinking that. But in the Indian literature, um, I have a, a, a lot of support for thinking this. There's a famous story of Pulasar. So King Kadavaraja decided to build the most magnificent temple in South India. And so in Kanjipuram, he, he got together the artists, artisans, sculptors, icon makers, temple architects, and brought them to Kanjipuram, he gave them all the money that they need, and he started building this magnificent temple. And uh, it was, and it's, it says that he even came and worked on it himself. Uh, he contributed his own labor to it as well. And the temple was coming up, it's magnificent. And uh, it's, it becomes time for the last ceremony. And the last ceremony is when the deity is installed in its place and there is, a, the sculptor comes, the sculptor has done everything else about the deity, but then he comes and he uses a special chisel, sometimes it's, it's said that it's made out of silver or gold or something like that, and um, a mirror is set in front of the deity and the deity's eyes are opened. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing that's done. So. And, and the glance has to come into the mirror so that that powerful glance won't, will be reflected back and not damage anything that's in the temple. And uh, so it's almost time, it's time for this last ceremony and the king goes to bed and he dreams uh, that Shiva, 
the God that's the, the deity of the temple that he's been building comes to him in the dream and he says, I'm so sorry, I can't come to the um, initiation ceremony where I'm supposed to be installed in your temple because I'm going to an even more spectacular temple and I have to be installed there at the same time. And the king is like, where is this more spectacular temple? And he sends his courtiers out in all directions and they look and there's no, oh, I, I forgot to say that Shiva says, you know, Pusalar has built this more magnificent temple for me. And they, he sends his courtiers out looking for Pusalar who's built this magnificent temple. There is no such magnificent temple. They find an old, poor, a poor, very old man just lying on, on his veranda somewhere. And they go to him and say, you know, where is this magnificent temple? And he says, um, oh, I'm just a poor man. There, I have no magnificent temple, but every night I've been imagining stone by stone, I've been erecting this temple and now I'm almost ready to install the deity in it. And Shiva thinks that temple is more important. So I think this is my validation for thinking that the imaginary opponent and the imaginary lover are very important for one's practice. So that's... Questions, comments? Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'd started a question, and then with your last story, perhaps my question doesn't really work anymore, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, forgive me if I've misunderstood, but I, I take a concept of, um, say, an initial stage in both dance and martial art where you are learning the, the moves and the shape, and then you progress to imagining... Your, your lover with you or your opponent, and that starts to add meaning and flow to the moves. Does that then suggest there's a third stage where the actual opponent in an actual fight and your actual lover to that dancer, it then has a similar parallel? I think what I was trying to say is that the actual is not really of interest. So certainly in Kaleri Payet, like there is no sparring as such. There is no people going at each other unchoreographed. So in Kaleri Payet, even the weapon sequences are always choreographed and they're not an, uh, an imitation of reality. That's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And therefore, I'm not sure what the next stage is. I, I, I wonder if there is um, some stage at which um, this imaginary opponent becomes unnecessary to even consider in the sequence. Um, I don't know whether that's... that's answer the question. I guess I got it. So I was very interested because you brought up uh, Peking Opera. Mm -hmm. And so there's this very, you know, men play female roles, but not in a transvestic sense. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, but in the modern, I, I saw these Peking Opera stars and they were complaining that they're saying, look, I, I'm playing a woman, but I'm married and I have a child, I'm not. And, and this is a big issue with uh, Farewell My Concubine, mm -hmm. which uh, the estate of the original actor became very upset because it implied that he could be homosexual and you know, th th this was a horrible thing. And they're saying he's, he is portraying, he is creating an idealized female portrayal, but you're not supposed to think Absolutely. that he's, yeah. and, 
And so this, I guess I was, I was trying to say, is there a difference or is this the same in, in the Indian sense that... It's, it's very much the same. And in, in fact, the, gr the great, well, many art forms in India, like in Peking Opera, were not, a, were not women were not doing women's roles. Certainly in Kathakali, that's the case. And if a woman did the women's roles the way the man did, it would be gross caricature. It wouldn't work. And, uh, but the men can do it, and they do it extremely in a theatrical world. That is the woman that they, it's not nothing to do with the real woman. And uh, I, th I think it is, I don't know enough about Peking Opera to say, but I think it would be uh, disturbing. And it's certainly what you see in India with the hijras as well, that they, they, they make no attempt to look like women. They're their own thing. And uh, it's, uh, it's the kind of playing at womanhood that's, the most important and the most fun. Uh, I have a question that pertains to the other senses. So mm -hmm. you talked about seeing as being seen, and I'm wondering about touching as being touched or hearing as being heard. Kind of in the sense of uh, Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology where you know mm -hmm. there's this point of intersection that's a not nothing mm -hmm. in between two separate things that aren't actually separate. Right. Uh, so in, in in Indian theory, there is nothing. I mean, s seeing becomes like a kind of touching, right? So it shares characteristics with touching, and darshan is is meant to be like a drinking in, a taking in of the of the deity's energy, power, whatever. But there is no similar word to darshan with hearing, or touching or even uh, with tasting the word obviously contains both senses but um, sparsh for example is the person touching and then there is another word for being touched thank you so much for your presentation Gita uh, I, I, I listened with great interest as you talked about the uh, Shiva going to the um, elders place but to me it speaks to the power of the believer you see as practitioners you know that we can make things so real and that he said even I have just a few more bricks or a few more stones you know so it speaks to our power you mm -hmm. know as practitioners and 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 when we're practicing and we're making things very vivid and very real. So thank you so much for bringing uh, another light to that for me, because for me, I think about trauma to train. Right. So if there is even a way to have other women read and learn, you know, it's mm -hmm. another application, but it, it'll work just fine. Thank you so much. Much of it is reminding me of shamanic work where, for example, the shaman calls for the spirit of an animal mm -hmm. and holds a belief system that the spirit of that animal then informs the human body and gives expression to the human body. And it's not an exactitude, but mm. it's near enough. And in terms of martial arts, I'm thinking of for example, the example of the praying mantis and how that, let's call it mimicry, biomimicry, builds an association and builds an associative field. And when you were talking about the example of the member of the audience that, that came up onto the stage, that psychological difference between the speaker and the audience somehow disappeared. And that for me in terms of what's happening in terms of modern society is really important because there there's no there's no distance there's proximity and the proximity draws people into 
a communal space, which is an expression beyond what they would be doing when they were sitting. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you could apply um, also your, 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 what you just presented to grappling martial arts, where there is actually bodily contact. Um, because in a way, the way you present it, I can see in Kalapayat that it's close to dancing because there are people performing, mm -hmm. but then when you don't have this aspect of performing, can you still work with uh, your idea or, or, yeah, can you look at it when, when there are people grappling and not thinking about performing? Well, you know, that, that's a really interesting question. And um, uh, in Kathakali, for example, which is one of these uh, art forms in India that kind of um, uh, goes in between dance and theater. Uh, sometimes the uh, artist will, will fight with his imaginary mace, and sometimes he'll pick up this prop mace. And the, the power of imagination is so... Uh, it, well, it, it functions in this way that we can only imagine the mace when it's not there. So the, the, the prop mace just curtails everything. It just shortens everything. It just makes it so much smaller than this incredible mace that he'd been wielding in his, you know, for us, this huge, big, heavy thing. And then all of a sudden it just becomes this prop. So I have a feeling that it can't. But I don't... I don't, I've never practiced a, a technique that involved um, uh, that kind of uh, contact. Like my, my son is a fencer, and he resists the idea, this idea altogether. He, does, he thinks I'm wrong to talk about Kaladi Payet and think about Kaladi Payet in this way. But um, so I think maybe two different things are going on when when you're actually fighting an opponent, it really might get in your way to imagine something. Um, and you picked on a bunch of themes that I think feed into a lot of the discussion that go into the, the East Asian martial arts, especially, as you mentioned, they rely very heavily on, on solo drills. Um, I'm curious about an aspect of, of how you're being taught the, um, on the Kalari side, because you talk about this idea that, well, you've got an opponent behind you, then the opponent's in front of you. I had a Hungar teacher once on well, the range of moves, said, well, this is, in much more colloquial terms, this is me melee fighting. Multiple opponents, this move here, this is clearing space around you in a brawl of multiple people, and this is making distance inside what's basically a gang fight. And mm -hmm. This is written into the structure of his, his forms. So, so <laughs> forms. You can imagine what they're aiming their training for, can't you? Um, and I, I, he was very explicit about where the opponent is, when there's multiple opponents, what do you do when there's all crowding in around you and so forth. Um, how explicit is Kalari teaching on the solo exercises in terms of single opponents, multiple opponents, multiple opponents in your tactical space, your imagined tactical space? Um, I, I'm not sure. So I have the feeling, I mean, th that uh, in Kalari Payet, teachers make things explicit for students when they ask. So my, my teacher has never said to me, your opponent is here, your opponent is there, or this is multiple opponents, or there is even an opponent. So, but if I ask, what is this move for? Then he'll say, this is a, a punch to the solar plexus. This is a hit to the groin. This is a, a getting around him. This is leaping towards him, and you're taking more space. These are answers to questions. And if, you, if you're in the Kalari in Kerala, you, you realize that nobody ever asks the question there. They've been brought up in the tradition. They started when they're five. And they just do what comes to them naturally as the teacher teaches. And so I'm very reluctant to say that anything of this is what's actually um, uh, taught in Kalari. But... There is this drill, and it can be empty for me, or it can be useful to me as a, as a form of practice. And um, so, yeah, as I say, I, you know, and sometimes I think that the answer has just been made 
right then to answer my question. I don't think that this is necessarily the answer. I asked a question. He didn't think about it too much. He came out with an answer. If I asked it next year, he might have a different answer. Um, can I ask a question, please? Um, I think um, I've, there's a very complicated question, a very simple question. I'll ask the simple question. Um, are you, in refusing to show a film of, of a dancer, are you not occupying a, a standard kind of dance theatre performance studies position which, which kind of fetishizes the ephemerality of, of, of the event of the act? Um, uh, and I think that the complicated stuff feeds into that because I think it is mm. quite complicated, like ontologically, like that the art is, is a complicated ontology here. You ask us to think about Plato, you ask us to think about seeing and being seen and so on. But, but can you say a little bit more about, about the, 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 the kind of the, the, your investment in the event and your refusal to... to so I've seen Kalari, Kalari Payat on YouTube. Mm -hmm. so I have seen it. <laughs> I have. I've also read about it and I, I know about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I honestly think that if you've seen Kalari Payat on YouTube, you haven't seen it. It's very, very different. I haven't felt it. Yeah, I well, felt it. Mm, yeah, but I don't think you've seen it either. And it um, like um, <laughs> uh, probably if there had been YouTube when I started doing Kalari Payet, and this is more than 30 years ago, um, I would never have, t have taken it up. It's just nothing like what you see on YouTube. The things that people feel the urge to videotape and put up on YouTube is not Kalari Payet. It's, that's not it. And that's not why I've been doing it for 30 years. It's not to do those things or to invest myself in any of that. And so I don't know what to say about this because as a dancer, one of the things that really um, used to bug me. At, at, I'd, I'd have painter friends and writer friends, and they'd all have their pile of books and their paintings to show, and I'd have nothing, right? I'd just done a dance performance, and I had nothing to show. But then after a while, it, you, you become like that um, fox jumping for the grapes. It's like, okay, I have nothing to carry around either. You know, I don't have a whole bunch of paintings that I now have to take care of and a whole bunch of old copies of my book that I now have to <laughs> store somewhere. So that it, it's, it's a mistake to think that it's fetishizing to the dance, I, I think. I, uh, the ephemerality. I think the ephemerality is what makes it valuable. And in Alva Noe's um, uh, taking up dance as uh, a mode of understanding consciousness, that's, that he makes, it, he makes that a point that, okay, this is why dance is such a good model of consciousness because consciousness is ephemeral and so is dance in this way and you can look at it uh, two things. So, I, you know, yeah. I'm going to impress you on that and ask uh, a, a series of two follow-up questions. So what's the problem with the rest of us? Because we all do things that are very similar and you know we have no problem recording them and putting them on YouTube and telling our students record yourself, put yourself on YouTube, watch yourself, this is how you study, this is how you understand your practice. Because yeah, there is that ephemeral moment of performance, but you know, then if you're you know reading the literature on practice and technique, there's also practice and technique that transcends performance. So when you don't show it, sure, you're you're not faking, um, or you you know you're not showing the simulacra of performance. But aren't you also depriving the audience of that opportunity to see technique and practice yes. and all these other elements? that go into any martial art. Yeah, and, and if you think that's what martial arts is, or if you think that's what dance is, technique, then put 
technique up on video, but I don't think that's what it is. So for me, it's, it's problematic. I don't think that uh, Kaleri Payet resides in the technique. Uh, the technique is constantly changing. And uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, within my lifetime, it's changed incredibly. And so if it was technique, then um, there would have to be, um, you'd have to deal with that, not me, right? You'd have to deal with the, it looked like this here and now it looks like this here and what's, what's going on. And uh, uh, there, there might be some useful analysis in that. But um, as a practitioner, I do think that it's a mistake to constantly look at yourself from the outside. And uh, it's a technique that uh, was never taught to me as a dancer. And in uh, ballet, for example, you, you work with a mirror uh, and you look at yourself from the, as if from the outside. But in Indian dance forms, you don't do that. There is no mirror. The only person who sees you is your guru. And then you concentrate on the inner feeling. When you get the movement right, it feels right. And the only person you trust to tell you about that is your teacher. And it's a very kind of heightened relationship that, that um, has a lot of, uh, of parameters, you know, that uh, you, you take it quite seriously. Uh, I just like to come in with maybe another way to think about some kinds of YouTube clips. Yeah. Because I have an intimation that I might understand what you mean by saying that's not it through an experience I have had a few times with a friend of mine who describes himself as a postmodern dancer mm. and he's a former, you know, very senior ballet dancer but now does this stuff which he would drag me along to where they roll <laughs> around the floor a yeah, lot, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. And I, I always enjoyed this. And then one time I couldn't go and he said, oh, it's on YouTube have a look and it was like torture mm. you know like because I don't want to watch a clip of someone rolling around the floor for 10 minutes mm. um, but when you're actually in the grotty little theater and you're looking at the entire sensory moment mm. um, you know it's great yeah. uh, so but one of the problems for me as somebody who just lives through video and film, mm. and, you know, I, I don't think there's much of me that isn't shaped by but, that. But look, a film is a film. I'm yeah. just saying a no, video no. of a dance is not a dance. It's not a dance. Yeah. But that's, that's the thing, that maybe what I'm learning to think about from listening to you is that perhaps one of the reasons why I don't like watching documentary fight clips is they have very low sensory mm. thought, yeah. if I can put it that way. They are records, they're you know, functional mm. teaching devices. Yeah. But if I show you a four minute clip of Yun Biao in gold shoes fighting a swordsman, mm. the ephemerality is the joy of the moment of watching that yeah, clip. Yes, yes, it's of course. completely yeah. different. And the only thing about the clip is you can repeat that experience. Yeah, you can. Um, well, that's, maybe. That's, you can, maybe you can. Maybe you can repeat every moment's it. Different. You might. Yeah. Um, it's not really a question, so maybe it'll be brief. It's just that when you were talking, it reminded me of something that I read, and I managed to find it, so I thought I'd just oh, share great. it. Great. Um, it's talking. It's from a, a book on the culture of copying in Japan. And the writer, I can't remember who it is at this point, but anyway, they say, the internalization associated with kata is more graphically illustrated in an example given by Amagasaki. He cites the case of Kanzaburo Nakamura, a kabuki actor who had difficulties learning the lines of the character known as young Rikaya, whose role he was yet to perform. He was to, to deliver the line, he has not arrived yet, in response to the question, isn't Yuranosuke here yet, spoken by his lord? In this play, Yuranosuke was Rikia's father and a senior member of the clan. 
The Lord was about to be made to commit a seppuku suicide and was desperate to speak to Yurunosuke. In rehearsal, the actor's senior colleague advised him to make an imaginary hole in the curtain where Yurunosuke was expected to appear and to look through the hole. The actor followed this advice imagined a hole in the curtain and tried to look through it into the far distance. At that moment, he realised he understood both katachi, that is kind of like form, and the heart at once. By perfectly copying the way he'd been shown how the rikia held his body in this act, the actor achieved a full understanding of how the character he was playing was feeling at that moment. He had learned katachi and had gone on to the next kata stage. Magasaki argues that the significance of learning kata lies in the fact that by copying an external physical form, that is, katachi, you recreate the internal kata, that is, the feelings and emotions of another. Oh, that sends so. shivers down my spine. That's wonderful. Thank you. I'll share the reference. Oh, yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, I think that's, that's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.